Walk Back the Line podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. This is a place that we bring together the world's leading experts on all things health and wellness to help you optimize your mind, body, and movement. Today's conversation is all sorts of contentious, uh, which I think is fun, exciting, I'm a big fan of contentious conversation. It is with my man, Dr. Paul Saladino, um, and it is about why we should stop eating all vegetables or fruits or anything that is not meat and uh, or some meat related product which doesn't include uh, or does include rather all the parts of the animal that is a a big differentiation that we get into this conversation so eating the eyeballs and the brains and the organs and all the different parts uh, from dr paul's perspective that is the most suitable nutrient form for our bodies and he gets into why he believes that Uh, i don't agree with anybody's perspectives really entirely i I had dr joel khan on a few weeks ago Uh, he's the vegan cardiologist and i don't agree with everything from the vegan camp or from the carnivore camp or any of those places so none of these these perspectives reflect my own belief system i just enjoy kind of standing on the sidelines and watching the world-leading experts tee off on what they think is best. As far as formal education, there are very few people in the world that you will meet that has more of it than Dr. Saladino. Um, he is board certified in psychiatry. He is uh, he studied with Dr. Andrew Weil at the University of Arizona in integrative medicine and nutritional biochemistry. Uh, he worked as a physician assistant in cardiology. He's also a MD. Um, he's pretty brilliant fella um, and it's pretty fascinating seeing him have this perspective he came from a place of pretty terrible autoimmune disease and we're going to get into his his story uh, in this conversation so he's certainly a special fella with a special case and a very special perspective that um, i think be interesting for people to give a chance i think it's probably going to be challenging for many people to wipe out all forms of vegetables or plant matter in their life Um, but uh, it's interesting to talk about and think about his book just came out and it is called the carnivore code and it's uh, it's up for sale and grab that thing it's unlocking the secrets to optimal health by returning to our ancestral diet the carnivore code paul saladino md uh forward by mark sisson of course thanks so much for checking out the website alignpodcast.com a-l-i-g-n podcast.com Uh, On there, you can start the Align Method online program, which is a seven-day free trial, no strings attached. You get in there, get the first week, breaks down some fundamental mobility practices, gets into some morning routine stuff, nighttime routine stuff, and if you are having any kind of issues with feeling like achy or stiff or rigid in your joints, you wake up in the morning, you feel kind of brain foggy and kind of like that, um, the Align Method online program can be of great benefit for you and it is absolutely free to check out and start for the first seven days. Uh, also includes a Align band, which is a heavy duty resistance band, comes with a door anchor and a free instructional video guide on how to use that thing. You can do some amazing work using a resistance band, especially enjoy using it for like yoga, which is pretty fascinating. Start using the band and kind of open it up while you're going through various different positions. You just wrap around your legs. Um, It's good stuff. Um, I think we're good. I hope you guys devour this conversation. I hope you're having a beautiful day. Thank you so much for reviews on iTunes. Thanks so much for reviews on the Align Method book. Thanks for grabbing the Align Method book. And uh, people have been really loving that. So I appreciate the shares. If you have any interest in sharing, that book, this podcast, any of that stuff, you can share with me at Align Podcast on Instagram. And I uh, look forward to hearing from you guys there. All right, back to the shizzy with Dr. Paul Saladino. So uh, how do you define what you, what is, what is a carnivore diet? What is that? <laughs> what the hell is that? I think that if we are trying to create reproducible constructs of how a human might eat to achieve optimal strength, performance, wellness, longevity, libido, etc., n- labels are useful. And 
that's what it is. It's a label. It's a, it's a system. It's an ideological system of eating that, in this case, challenges many widely held traditional beliefs and is quite contrarian. So what was the path that led you? What's your history uh, with nutrition before that? And then what's the path that led you to this point of uh, excluding all forms of vegetables or fruits or anything that's not an animal based product. Right. It's ludicrous, right? It's pretty crazy. I thought it was nuts when I first heard about it too. So as you and I were talking about earlier today, my journey in medicine has been a long one. I was a vagabond for six years after college and then went to PA school as a physician assistant, practiced for in cardiology for four years but pretty quickly, as a cardiology PA, became disillusioned with what I saw in the realm of health and wellness or in the realm of medicine in general. I realized that most of what I was doing as a cardiology PA was giving medications to ameliorate symptoms without correcting the root cause of an illness. And that wasn't satisfying for me because what was most interesting or the biggest questions that were constantly moving around and around my brain were what the heck is causing illness? What is causing imbalance in people's physiology? Why do chronic diseases happen? And we're talking about all kinds of things from atherosclerosis, which was the main thing that I was working with then. So plaque formation in the arteries as a cardiology PA to um, other things, uh, cancers, autoimmune disease, endocrinologic issues, which are usually autoimmune, chronic inflammatory issues, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. What is causing these chronic autoimmune issues. And so after I worked as a PA for a few years, I realized that I was going to have to go back to medical school because I wanted to be a part of understanding the roots of these diseases rather than simply handing out medications. And so I went back to medical school and then I did residency and then I've found myself now at this point where I am. But over those subsequent eight years of medical school and residency after uh, doing the PA training and then PA practice, I was trying to see the re-education in medicine that I was experiencing through a different lens. I was trying to see it through the lens of somebody that had already been in medicine a little bit, wasn't really going to accept the mainstream paradigm, and wasn't really satisfied just knowing what medications to give, which is the main thing that we're taught in medical school, is this sort of, this sort of decision tree-based algorithm um, of which medication to give for a certain uh, ailment. But trying to see if I could find commonalities in what I was observing in patients that might give me an indication of what the actual roots of these diseases were. It will come as no surprise to you or most of the people listening to this podcast, I would imagine that I think the biggest lever in, in, in health and disease is, is food. And um, you and I are going to record a podcast for my podcast after this, in which we'll talk about how a big lever could be movement and alignment of the body. But for me, like my, my shtick, what's most interesting for me is the biochemistry of humans, the immunologic reactions of humans to the food that we take in. That's a huge lever. And so then the question becomes, how do we eat to be optimal? What are the foods that fuel us and what are the foods that hurt us? And that's a fascinating question that I've really been iterating in my mind over and over over the last 10, 15 years in my medical career. And the carnivore diet, my interest in a carnivore diet has been born out of that continual search for understanding which foods build us up and which foods break us down. Personally, it was driven by continued illness in myself, specifically manifest as eczema, so my own skin autoimmune disease that really would not go away despite what I believed to be a very healthy diet, which was essentially an organic paleo diet. So no grains, no beans, no dairy, entirely organic, high quality meats, high quality fruits and vegetables. And yet my eczema persisted to the point that it was in fact sometimes so severe that it limited what I could do. I had eczema all over my back at times in residency and when I was in medical school, I did a lot of jujitsu and I had eczema that was so severe on my elbows and knees that at times I needed IV antibiotics and once got septic and it was bad. I had bad eczema that would continually flare despite my efforts to, um, to really cut out what I believed were the most common food triggers. And so knowing that I wasn't really fully being able to quell my own autoimmune illness, I, I realized that at least for me and perhaps for other people, there was more to the equation. And so I kept thinking, well, maybe I should cut more out. So I cut out oxalate containing foods and then I cut out histamine containing foods and then I cut out salicylate containing foods. And these are all different types of plant foods that have these various um, compounds in them, which can be triggering to some people. And then eventually it all kind of clicked when I heard Jordan Peterson on Joe Rogan one day talking about a carnivore diet 
and his rapid improvement in what appears to have been a nonspecific autoimmune arthritis that he had and a variety of other autoimmune issues that he had as well. And I thought, at first I thought, that's crazy. Like plants are valuable. We've been told plants are valuable from the perspective of polyphenols, from the perspective of fiber, from the perspective of quote unquote phytonutrients. You can't get rid of them. How can that be possible? How can humans just live on pure meat or at least pure animal products? But that curiosity quickly gave way to personal research and digging into more uh, investigations about what plants actually had that was beneficial in them and potential downsides, these large array of plant toxins that are present in the variety of the plants that we eat. And I decided to give a carnivore diet a try and then had my own personal experience with it, which was striking. Um, the eczema that I'd had for years and years and years quickly went away within a few weeks. And then surprisingly, mood got better. I wasn't even expecting that. I didn't think my mood was in any way, shape or form impaired, but the mood got better and the outlook that I had on life got better. It was a very strange experience to eliminate all plants and then suddenly feel like the world was seen through different colored glasses. And that piqued my interest. And that was the beginning of probably the last year and a half of just full, um, just a full deep dive into what is going on with this way of eating and why it might be beneficial. So what, is it possible that you and Jordan Peterson are outliers in this and that the rest of like the omnivorous world that doesn't get eczema from eating steamed kale or what have you, um, perhaps like they don't have the same genetic variation, whatever it may be, or is it like that that will create some type of inflammatory response for every person? So anything's possible and both of those hypotheses are, are valid. Um, or viable. It's just, I don't think we know what the answer to that question is. Um, it's certainly possible that there are some people on the planet who are much more sensitive to certain plant foods than other plant foods. But my suspicion and the hypothesis that I would suggest, or at least the thesis that I advance in my book, which is called The Carnivore Code, is that most people are going to feel better without any plant toxins. And if people don't have overt signs of toxicity or inflammation related to plants, and they're really kicking all the ass they want in their life, then who am I to tell them to change what they're doing? And perhaps they're not being affected negatively by plants. But the question that is always kind of under the surface is, could they still be better? Is there some way in which the plants are negatively affecting them that they're not even aware of? I didn't even have an awareness of the fact that I was not as positive as I could be, that I was not as resilient emotionally as I could be. My outlook on life changed immediately and my mental clarity got better when I cut them out completely. So there were aspects that I knew were negative and that needed to be improved, the eczema. And there were other aspects that were quite a surprise to me. So your point is well taken. There, I, I think that there are people who can do some plants in their diet without having overt negative effects. And then I also wonder if they could be even better without those plants in their diet. And I accept that there are a lot of people who want to eat plants for convenience, for entertainment, for enjoyment. But the, the ideas I advance in the book are trying to help people understand that number one, animal foods are where we get the majority of our nutrients. That animal meat, animal organs, animal fat are really the richest source of all the nutrients that we're aware of as humans today on the planet. And that's really not debatable in terms of sheer amount of those nutrients and sheer bioavailability of those nutrients. Animal foods are clearly superior. And the second piece of what I'm suggesting in the book... all animal foods? Or is that... Because then the, the, like the big kind of drop off for me is where it's like, well, a, a venison from Maui is vastly different than like a... a a sick cow from Bakersfield. Sure, of course. What or the, maybe not. I don't know. I'm no, not. absolutely. You're right. What the animal eats is important. And I think that in the book, I advocate strongly for grass-fed and grass-finished meats and meats of the highest quality. So, yes, absolutely. It's the same with plants that we grow as well, right? If a plant is grown in nutrient-deficient soil, we know the plant is going to have different amounts of things in it. Animals are the same. What we feed animals affects the nutrient content of their tissues. But overall, as a whole, and if we are thinking about the best types of animals that we can eat, then animal foods are clearly superior to plant foods in, in every way, shape, or form uh, from a bio, uh, biochemical standpoint in terms of nutrient adequacy and availability for humans. And then the other side of the equation that I talk about in the book is that plant foods are toxic and plant foods do contain toxins. And if we really look at the spectrum of plant toxicity Basically, plants do not want to get eaten, whether it's this blade of grass, 
this ivy behind us, these berries here. Um, fruit is a little different story that we can talk about, but the leaves on that bush are a good example, or the roots of any plant. Plants don't want to get eaten, and animals don't want to get eaten either, but animals can run away or bite or use antlers. Plants are rooted in the ground, and so what we discover quickly, and this is not controversial, is that every plant that we ingest has some a, amount of a toxin in it, and the book calls into question the notion of how benign those actually might be in most people. There are some that are known to be quite poisonous. I mean, we know there are poisonous plants in the world that will kill us if we eat them. And there are, there's a whole spectrum of that toxicity, right? Now the idea of oxalates is being more advanced and people are more aware that, man, oxalates are probably not a great thing, but some people may be more sensitive than others. And then there's this idea of lectins as advanced by Stephen Gundry, and perhaps that's triggering reactions for some people. But... As I suggested earlier, there's other toxins that we're not even heard of. Not, we don't even talk about the whole lot. Things like salicylates, or I would argue strongly in the book that polyphenols have been widely misinterpreted and misconstrued, and we can talk about that in detail. That's the whole concept of xenohormesis. And then other compounds, isothiocyanates, things like sulforaphane um, from the brassica vegetables, I think have been widely mischaracterized. And when we look at what they're actually doing in the human body, I think it's very clear that they're plant toxins that are being used to target the animals eating these plants to dissuade them from doing so. So the question becomes, why would we eat plants if we can get all of the nutrients we need from animals without any of the potential toxins found in plants? And again, this is a hypothesis. This is an opinion that I'm advancing in the book, but I'm trying to provide as much evidence as I can with as much scientific river, rigor to show people that it actually does hold water and we see... Uh, clinically, that tons and tons of people now are finding significant improvements when they eat this way, especially those who do have illnesses, right? There's a whole broad category of people in society who have autoimmune illness, who have inflammatory illness, who are not getting better with traditional therapies. Um, as we discussed earlier, traditional therapies usually don't actually target the root cause of the symptoms and often have many side effects if they're pharmaceutical. But even with other therapies that are suggested by functional medicine practitioners, elimination diets, a lot of people are not getting resolution of their disease, their autoimmune disease, their inflammatory illness. And in those situations, this is a very viable option. And I think that the, the very compelling possibility is that the plants that remain in many of our diets could still be triggering those issues for people. So Dr. Gundry, I've had him on here. Um, he's, a, he's a friend. He did an endorsement for the book, actually. In his book, he talks about how we can do certain things like pressure cooking and such and fermenting and various different practices to help uh, reduce the effect of those lectins and the various different chemicals that may be like the, the plant's defense mechanism. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Uh, we can. That will denature some of the toxins in plants, but we have to back up and just realize what we're talking about there. We're admitting that we're detoxifying plants, right? You're, that acknowledges the fact that plants have toxins and that in order to eat those plants, we are going to have to process them in a special, very intentional way, which is what our ancestors have needed to do throughout evolutionary history. If we look at the historical consumption of plants by humans, we can't know for sure how this has happened, but this is probably the application of fermentation. and Fermentation is not necessarily to make foods taste better. It's to detoxify them because eating them raw, especially in the case of isothiocyanates and many of these polyphenols, we take in a lot of these bioactive compounds which can negatively affect human physiology. So yes, fermentation can be a detoxification strategy and to accept that accepts the facts that plants at a basic level are toxic and are really trying to dissuade us from eating them. And we can process them in a way that makes them less toxic, but some of the toxins will remain and we don't pressure cook or ferment all of the plants we're eating now, right? And then the question becomes, why would we eat survival food, as I call it in the book, right? If plants need to be that processed and that fermented and that pressure cooked and that much uh, effort has to be taken to remove the toxins from plants, in my opinion, in my view, they're really second-class citizens. We can eat them in a pinch. If you and I are out hunting, we don't have uh, a successful kill for a number of days, we can eat plants that we ferment as survival foods, as fallback foods. But to make them the majority of our diet ignores the fact that really 
they're not meant to be that as humans, nor do I believe the fossil record or the anthropologic record suggests that that's how we've used them throughout our evolution. I think that we've used them as survival foods. And many people now are beginning to use them as primary foods. And in fact, the message now and for many functional medicine practitioners or many in the health space is to use them as the primary foods. I did a debate with Stephen Gundry that people can find on um, my channel and his channel in which we kind of went head to head on these issues. I mean, Stephen wants people to use plants as the main food that they're getting. Why would we shun the most nutritious foods on the planet, the, the really the king foods, the 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 foods that are prized more than anything by all indigenous cultures, the animal foods, why would we shun those in favor of plants or elevate plants above those? That doesn't make sense evolutionarily, especially when we always have to detoxify the plants. And as I mentioned, I'll just highlight it and then I'll pause. Those processes don't remove all the toxins. That doesn't remove oxalates. It doesn't remove all of the things that can potentially be triggering for us. And we're not doing that to all of our foods. And then we have to realize what is the loss of other nutrients in those foods when we do that? As you know, when you pressure cook, when you ferment many foods, they basically become kind of mush, right? And you can use it for calories, but you're never going to get the nutrients that you need as a human by eating those foods. Either, even if they're raw, you're really not going to get them from plants. But once you ferment and pressure cook, you're further denaturing them. We're basically turning active plant foods into non-active plant foods that we can use in a survival situation. But I don't think that gives them a unique value. It makes them more acceptable and less toxic. But it really reminds us that, after all, plants are toxic. Yeah. You paint a really interesting picture I heard on uh, my buddy Sean Stevenson's podcast. of uh, One thing you said that was interesting was that I'd like you to just say, if you can... The, the soccer ball analogy, the dude buried under the ground. I thought that was really fascinating. And then also you paint a really interesting depiction of our evolutionary history um, and, you know, like the, the rapid growth of the brain and all of that stuff. Is it possible to get into that a little bit? Sure. So as I hinted at earlier, we have to imagine the way that plants might feel. We're mobile humans. You know, you and I have been moving around all afternoon shooting bows. And if... If somebody's walking a dog around here and the dog gets off the leash and runs at us in a menacing way, we can get up and move around, right? I can move out of the way. Or if, um, you know, if, if we're in a situation in the city and some guys start hanging around us and they look kind of ominous, we can just walk through the direction. We can move away. Animals have the ability to move away from other animals and run as a defense mechanism. Or we can fight back, you know? You and I might have some, uh, some jiu-jitsu skills or some karate skills, and we can actually fight back against people. Or if the dog decides to I jump towards carry, us. carry mace and a, and a uh, rape whistle. That's my move. <laughs> that works, too. <laughs> <laughs> or you can climb a tree, right? <laughs> right? But, um, but a plant is stuck in the ground, man. A plant is stuck in the ground. So every plant that is surrounding us now as we're sitting outside of my apartment is stuck in the ground and any animal, whether it's you or I, an insect or any herbivorous animal that decides to wander through here, can walk up to any one of these trees and nibble on its leaves, eat its bark, eat any berries that are available. The, the plant cannot run away. The plant is rooted in the ground. And so the thought exercise that I shared with Sean was, imagine that you and I are at the beach and after we go surfing, uh, I'm gonna be like, I just, hey Aaron, let me bury you in the sand and I'm gonna dig this dig this really big hole and bury you very t tightly up to your neck so that you can't get out and all that's sticking out is your head and be like ah this is great right it's like when you were a kid this is a fun story and then I'm gonna play a joke on you and I'm gonna paint your head like a soccer ball you're gonna be like what are you doing Paul I'll be like well just you'll see so I'm painting your head like a soccer ball just to kind of joke with you and then all of a sudden a busload of irascible hungry uh six-year-olds arrives from soccer practice and they start hanging around on the beach and they don't have a ball, but your face is painted like a ball. How are you going to feel? You're going to feel very vulnerable. And that's how plants feel. They are stuck in the ground. And plants and animals have co-evolved for 450 million years with plants in this predicament, with plants stuck in the ground up to their neck with their faces painted like a soccer ball with a bunch of uh, energetic six-year-olds who are underfed and a little irritable who want to kick something, right? And this is obviously a metaphor, but what we're seeing here is that Plants have needed to evolve defense mechanisms. It's been part of plant and animal coevolution, and it's been part of an arms race. It's been part of a back and forth balance because plants are needed in the ecosystem and animals are needed in the ecosystem. And between herbivores and plants, we see the same behavior where 
the herbivores know that all the plants have toxins. And so they can only eat a small amount of every plant before moving on to another plant or else they will become sick. And then plants have done the same thing with insects where they develop toxins to dissuade the insects from over consuming them or really consuming them at all. And it's this delicate balance in the ecosystem. But it, the, the exercise is just meant to help people understand the way that plants feel and sort of a little bit of you know an uh, anthropomorphization around plants impetus for developing these chemical toxins yeah. so my curiosity with that is it's kind of like I, from my camp if i have one which i don't think i do but from my perspective i feel like plants one it would be challenging to clump all plant matter into one category in the similar way that it would be challenging to clump like all animals so like eating a dolphin might be different than eating a salmon you know, so I wonder if perhaps there is a difference such as the berries that have you know, seeds that want to be spread and want to be pooed out by some critter. Wouldn't those plants be different than, say, something like, a, you know, one of these bushes that really has no need other than to get, you know, destroyed by another animal? Like an animal consuming their leaves would just be destroying it. So we're talking about, if we're t we can talk about the fruit versus the leaves, stems, and roots of a plant. So many yeah. fruit, many plants do make fruits or they have some way to distribute their seeds. And if you look at seeds of plants, seeds are uniquely toxic because plants don't want those to get eaten. And this is actually in line with what Stephen Gundry would say with lectins. When we think about seeds, seeds are seeds, grains, nuts, and legumes. Those are all seeds. Those are all plant babies, quote unquote whether we're talking about a pine tree with, you know, a pine seed or um, a, a berry with a seed in the middle, the seed in the middle of a fruit is actually very toxic, almost universally. Um, and in cases where it's not, it's because we've hybridized it to make it less toxic. Almonds are from a family of plants that have a very large amount of cyanogenic glycosides in them, and we've just hybridized them in the last few hundred years to make them less toxic. But if you were to go back a thousand years or even 500 years and eat an ancestral almond, it would have a large amount of a cyanide-producing compound in it. These are found in all of the stone fruit seeds, apricots, cherries, um, any of these little type stone fruits have cyanogenic glycosides in the seeds. They're a very strong signal to animals don't eat me. And then plants are intentionally trying to encase those toxic seeds or the very heavily protected seeds in a sweet coating so that animals will eat that, not eat the seed, and then poop it out further away, right? So that's the one exception. So a plant does want its fruit to get consumed, and we can talk about that. The benefits of fruit in humans are pretty negligible beyond calories. Um, I don't think many people will be able to make strong arguments that humans should be eating tons and tons of fruit. Um, based on the fructose content, content, other sugars, and what we know that does to dental and other health uh, in terms of metabolism. But when we're looking at the rest of the plant, the roots, the stems, the leaves, um, especially plant sprouts, those are all pretty much universally full of chemicals that are meant to dissuade things from eating them. If every plant around us right now were the equivalent of like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory scene where it's just a bunch of edible candy for for insects and animals and fruits and vegetables, this would all be eaten, right? We would just be eating the heck out of everything. If this were all, if this grass were candy and there were no uh, plant toxins in it, you know, it, it would, animals would be eating this right and left. It's just this delicate sort of push-pull struggle. And if, when we actually look at the chemical nature of these plants, they all have toxins. And they're just whether or not we know them, whether or not we've characterized them. And there's a great paper by Bruce Ames called Dietary Pesticides 99.9% .9 All Natural in which he details and references uh, previous studies that have been done with many plant compounds. And it's not so much that these compounds are not present in plants, it's that they're present and they've in some cases been text tested on a variety of animals and found to be harmful. And in many cases, we don't even know what so many of these compounds and plants do to humans. They've just never been tested. There are thousands and thousands of these chemicals. I mean, cabbage alone in that paper is listed with 42 chemicals that are known to have negative biologic activity, either breaking DNA in cell culture, which is called clastogenesis, or negatively affecting other processes in the human body. 42 chemicals in cabbage, and those are just the ones we know about. Yeah. Can you, the, the, the story of the human brain growing, can you get into that a little bit? Because I find that to be quite interesting. I'd love yeah. to share that. Yeah, so this is quite interesting. There's a graph in my book. By looking at the size of the human cranium, by looking at the size of a human skull or a pre-human skull over the last 
six million years, over the last 30 million years, if we go back to our primate ancestors and that pre-evolution, we can get a sense of the brain size. What we see is that prior to the separation from the chimpanzee lineage about six million years ago, uh, our, our ancestors' brains were about 350 milliliters large, 350 cc's in size. Now, they've been, they were about that same size for 30 to 60, year, 60 million years before that. So eating, eating mostly plants as chimps do never grew a bigger brain in chimpanzees for 60 million years. And then what appears to have happened is a shift in the tectonic uh, plates in East Africa. The East African Rift Valley rose up, uh, creating savanna from forests. Um, and a lineage of chimpanzees moved out of the trees and into the savanna and was forced to adapt the way they walked, the way they moved, and the way that they hunted animals, or the way that they ate, at least. And we start to see changes in the fossil record um, between that 6 million mark year mark to about 3.5 million years ago in which people or our pre-human ancestors, these people are not yet considered to be human, uh, are starting to look differently. They look a little more like us. The pelvic girdle's changing. Um, the angle of the ribs is changing gradually, suggesting maybe changes in the way our guts were built. And the brains start to get a little bigger in that amount of time. And then something about 2.5 million years ago happened and what we see is a really sharp inflection point in the size of the human brain so that from about 2 to 2.5 million years ago to until now, the brain tripled in size or even quadrupled in size to a maximum size of about 1,600 cc's. So about 2 to 2.5 million years ago, the brain had grown to 500 cc's. And then in the, in the following 2 million years, it grew to over 1,600 cc's. And so if you look at the size of the human brain, it's kind of going like this. And then all of a sudden at 2 million years, it just goes straight up like, like a rocket ta ship taken off. So something happened in human evolution 2 million years ago that had a profound impact on the size of our human brain. And in the book, I present the case, which has been echoed by others, that it was the eating of animals that did that by providing more nutrients, specific nutrients, including DHA, calories, other nutrients that are really only found in animal foods, creatine, uh, insignificant amounts that, uh, that probably propelled this change in the human brain size, which allowed us to cooperate more as humans and become who we are today. So that in the fossil record, we see a number of things that corroborate the assertion that this was eating animals. About two million years ago is the first time that we see Acheulean tools, which are these bifacial tools. If you held an Acheulean tool, you would know that it was a tool that was shaped by someone. It's, it looks like a large arrowhead. Um, it's clearly made by something with intelligence using other tools or rocks to sharpen a bifacial edge. We start to see these two million years ago and we start to see them move around, meaning that they are moved from place to place, indicating that the people using these tools had a sense of their value. Rather than just making something and discarding it, they would make a tool and pick it up with them as they moved from place to place, which is really the first time in human history that we see that happening two million years ago. We also start to see cut marks on the bones of animals at this same time where uh, we would have butchered uh, meat away from the bone. And this is in places like the hip and other places on animals where it would not have been something that we were using to kill an animal. It would have been the butchering of an animal um, that created these cut marks as we were actually moving meat away from the bone or uh, separating the meat from fascia as we were eating it. And then the, the third thing that we start to see is evidence for group hunting with large animals all slotted together at the end of canyons in blind, uh, blind, uh, blind canyons where there's nowhere for the animals to run or off the edges of cliffs together, suggesting that humans, at this point we can potentially, we, we start to call them humans if we're thinking of Homo erectus or Homo habilis, um, were cooperating together to hunt animals in a concerted fashion and drive them off cliffs in large kill situations. So the three things there together suggest, yeah, humans started hunting then, and that is exactly when we start to see the brain get really big, really fast. Yes. And so the premise that I advance in the book is that hunting animals made us human. It wasn't eating plants for 60 million years, which we were doing before that. It was eating animals made us human and allowed our brains to grow. And there's lots of research to further support this when we look at levels of B12 and other B vitamins involved in the methylation cycle. 
uh, in humans, and we can correlate levels of B12, folate, and riboflavin with brain size. Well, as you know, there's not a lot of B12 in animal foods, uh, and, excuse me, in plant foods, and James Wilkes would disagree with that, and I would debate him any day on that, but there's really no B12 in plant foods, nor is there really any B12 in our environment other than animal foods. We really can't get B12 from the soil in any appreciable amount. That's a misconception. There are B12 analogs in the soil that don't have B12 biological activity, nor can we get enough B12 by drinking lake water uh, because, as James Wilkes presented in the debate with Joe Rogan, those figures were based on overgrowth of an algae organism called euglena, which is only present in some English lakes in the middle of the summer when it's very warm and fresh water that's moving doesn't have any significant amount of euglena. There's really no way scientifically to get any significant amount of B12 in water or dirt or anything. We had to get it from animals. And that was really one of the first times in our life that we had access to that food. And that was a big part of our change in brain size and this change in our trajectory as humans we can correlate, as I suggested, levels of B12 with brain size in humans. And there's an interesting study that I noticed that I mentioned in the book where you can say, show that those who are eating a vegan and vegetarian diet, diet have lower levels of B12 and actually have smaller brains. And what we've seen with the size of the human brain is that since 40,000 years ago, it's begun to shrink. And this is hypothesized to be related to a number of things. One of the hypotheses has to do with our sudden dependence on farming, which happened about 15,000 years ago with the Neolithic Revolution um, and our shunning of hunting. But for whatever reason, the human brain has shrunk a little bit from the apex. And uh, one of the compelling ideas is that may have been related to a decrease in animal foods with the Neolithic Revolution, with farming, uh, and with a move away from what appears to have been a primarily hunting-based existence for our ancestors for at least the last two million years. Hmm. Can we talk about you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, why did you go to school so long? Holy crap. It's like impressive. What is it? 14 years. A lot of years, man. What's that like? What does that do to a person? <laughs> you know, as we were talking about when I was shooting the bow... I, I took a lot of time off, too. I mean, I went to high school, and I went to college right after high school. And then after college, I was pretty burned out, pretty focused. And uh, I just decided to take six years off. I didn't know how long I was going to take off. I didn't know that I was going to go back to school at that time. But I took six years and just traveled. It was a ski bomb. We were in a lot of the same places, ski bombing, though not at the same times. Uh, I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. I just I was a mountain biker. I just wanted to explore and kind of give the brain a break. And then... Eventually, I had curiosity. I realized that I like biology, I like chemistry, and I like thinking about this stuff. This is the kind of stuff that makes... It's just a fun, it's just a fun project for me to, to, to think about puzzles and to think about the way things fit together. And so I was living in Bend, Oregon at the time and working in a bike shop there. And I thought, you know what? It's time to go back to school. I want to go back. So I went to be a physician assistant first. And I didn't know I was going to go back to medical school at the time. But as I suggested, or as I talked about in the beginning of the podcast... Because of what I saw as a PA, I felt called to go back to medical school and to continue the training um, so that I had more autonomy and could do more of this type of root cause medicine. So it, it hasn't felt arduous. It's been interesting. I think that these questions are some of the most satisfying ones that I've personally come across. And that's what drives us, right? Your questions are movement. And so it doesn't feel like work for you when you're thinking about movement or you're researching that, whether it's anatomy or physiology or fascial movement planes, whatever. And I, I've just been obsessed, man. I, I'm obsessed with understanding human health and disease. And so it's just been this continual process of it's time to go back. And medicine is great. Uh, medicine doesn't do a great job of treating people in terms of chronic disease, but it's a fascinating place to be. And over those 14 years, I saw a lot of sick people and it gave me a lot of data to pull from as I was trying to think about what could be at the root cause of these things. So you have to generate this data. I can't just, I mean, I, you can, I guess I can make conjecture and try and understand, you know, what's causing these things, but being able to see people sick and think about what they're doing in their lives and try things over the last, you know, decade plus have been instructive for me and it's been a fun journey. It's not felt arduous per se, because I'm just, there, there were no questions that were more meaningful to me. It's what I absolutely had to do. 
I want to take a brief moment and thank the show's sponsor, Osea Malibu. That's O-S-E-A Malibu. They are some of, hands down, the highest quality skincare products that I have possibly come across. Uh, they are sustainably packaged, non-toxic, cruelty-free, and vegan, made with love in California, as they say. I'm holding some of the containers right now. I'm holding the Atmosphere Protection Cream. It's made with organic seaweed, moisturizer, firms, and protects the skin from environmental stressors. Uh, really excellent stuff. I also got the argon oil here. Uh, everything is absolutely the utmost highest quality that you could possibly find for skincare, which is important because when you are putting stuff on your skin, you're absorbing that into your body. Uh, so don't think you're getting away with putting nonsense garbage on your skin from Walmart or whatever. Uh, you got to get good stuff and this is exactly that. It's I absolutely stand behind the quality of all the ingredients and you can get yourself $10 off your first purchase of $50 or more by going to oseamalibu.com slash align. That's O-S-E-A Malibu dot com slash align a-l-i-g-n for ten dollars off your first purchase of fifty dollars or more also free shipping for u.s orders uh that are seventy dollars or more and uh, also free samples with every order so jump over to osea malibu dot com slash align that's o-s-e-a malibu dot com slash align for ten dollars off your first purchase all right back to the show What do you think the root of the seemingly insatiable thirst for information around wellness came from? Because going to school for 14 years, you know, out of going to school for whatever, you know, 12 years, whatever that is, like grade school, it's like a lot of time of, of one's life to keep one dipping into the pond. So, like, what do you think the, do you have any sense of what the root of that is or was? I don't like taking my car to the mechanic. Yeah. I don't like I don't like it when something is broken and I don't know how to fix it. And a car is something that all of us use, most of us use. Some of us are perhaps fortunate to be in positions where we don't need to use a car and I'm envious of that, but I've always had to use a car in my life. And some of the most disempowering moments of my life were taking a car to a mechanic that's broken and not knowing how to fix it myself. Well, this corporeal form that I inhabit is my, it's the lens through which I experience the world. It's the vessel. The quality of my life is directly tied to how well this automobile that I inhabit with my soul functions, right? So I just wanted to be a race car driver. I just wanted to be a mechanic. I just wanted to understand how to make this corporeal vessel as kick ass as possible. I've just always been obsessed with that. That's been my interest as a runner, as an athlete. In everything I've done, I've wanted to understand how to make this vessel as good as possible. I want to think as clearly as possible. I want to recover as well as possible. I want to be able to have as much energy. Uh, I want to be powerful. I want libido. And I want um, my body to perform well as long as it can, right? I don't want chronic disease and sickness. I don't want decrepitude. I don't want it to break down prematurely. I want to kick butt up until the day before I die, and then I want to die swiftly. And so... I think for me, I just had this very clear sense of mortality. And this is, in a way, my struggle against mortality. It's trying to understand how the heck am I going to get the most out of this life? Well, it's through this body. You get this, right? We're similar in that sense. Like my mind, my body, these are intimately, incredibly tied to what we eat. There is no greater lever in human health and disease and biochemistry than the things we are putting in our bodies. So to understand that has just been such a fascinating journey for me because I want to drive a Porsche. I want to drive an F1 car, dude. I don't want to drive a Civic. Yeah. Do you think there's any potential association with like things like eczema or any kind of physical manifestation on somebody's skin or sickness, illness, um, to be some form of like emotional wrap up, you know, root connection association, or do you think it's purely food? I, I don't think it's entirely food, and I think the biggest lever by far is biochemistry and food, right? I noticed that when I was inflamed, when I was eating foods that appeared to trigger me, stress could push me over the edge. But what I think you're asking is, could, do I believe eczema could be triggered exclusively by stress? And my answer to that is no. I don't think that... That's me. 
What's up? No, that's great. Oh, right, you we'll paused it? I paused it. Oh, don't pause it. No, we don't pause here. No, we love capturing things. All right, well, now I need to explain since you paused it. We, so we just had a moment where uh, our celebrity carnivore was, uh, was witnessed by a walking man and... He uh, reached out to say hello. Yeah, we were. There's a the guy party. walking by, and he that goes, was hey. great. I don't know when you paused it exactly, but that was, oh, yeah. that was a great moment. That was a great moment. In podcast history, there we capture it. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But, but so my question isn't is it purely? I just I think that there's you know it's like all of these different aspects of the human experience, including nutrition and emotions, movement, environmental factors, like all of that. They're just spokes, and if one's stress bucket which isn't my term gets built up enough that it overflows and that's when it seems like disease manifests but if the stress is below the tipping point then it's a hermetic stressor and it's something that we can grow stronger from you know so i wonder if like how and from your perspective saying food is the strongest lever um where would thoughts and feelings and history and all that belief systems be or what would the, the strength or length of that lever be so I think th our biochemistry determines the size of our stress bucket. And what I mean by that is that when our biochemistry is in line, when our biochemistry is um, calm, and when our biochemistry is optimized, we have the ability to tolerate more stress in other parts of our life. Does that make sense? And so that is why I think, and I think food is biochemistry, right? I'm talking about the physical biochemistry of an organism. And so this was my personal experience, and this has been the experience that I've had working as a physician with other clients and, and people in general, is that when our physical biochemistry, when our internal workings are better, we are more emotionally poised, we are more physically strong, we are able to recover better, we sleep better, more energy, libido, etc. And so that is the size of our stress bucket, really. And so... I think that those all come into play and the organic nature of a human being as a biochemical machine is, is immutable, it is really the ultimate arbiter and that is something that we affect fundamentally with food and biochemistry. And if we eat foods that are toxic, that create toxins in our body or that create leaky gut by um, causing the immune system to become activated or by damaging the gut lining directly, we decrease the size of our stress bucket and we are more susceptible to other things in our life. But I agree with you that our emotional well-being, our stress, these are important. I, but I see it as the stronger you are as a person biochemically, the stronger you are organically, the more resilient you are to those other things. Yeah. And certainly they all play in, but food and fundamental human biochemistry is still this foundational that is the bedrock upon everything that upon which everything is built and i don't think this is too controversial right if you're thinking about helping somebody move their nutritional basis is going to determine how well they're going to be able to move if they're if they're undernourished if they're protein malnourished if they have an imbalance between methionine and glycine and their fascia is not strong or their connective tissue is weak they're going to get injured right? They could be doing the exercise wrong. They could be moving improperly or out of alignment. But if they're fundamental building blocks, if the fundamental molecular building blocks that someone is constructed of are, or what am I looking for here, are inadequate or suboptimal, nothing else is going to work well. Our body isn't going to work isn't going to move well. Our muscles aren't going to be strong. We're not going to recover well. Our brain isn't going to work well. We can have neuroinflammation. Our neurotransmitters won't be in the ideal ratios. If the immune system is activated for a variety of reasons, then things are just not going to work well. So still, it kind of comes back to that foundation, like pour the concrete of the house and then build everything upon it. But that was my experience, that when I re-poured the concrete on my house, when I took plants out of my diet, I felt like a different person from a fundamental level, mentally, physically, etc. Yeah. So I, I don't think I have a meaningful enough, an opinion because I haven't actually tried, uh, I haven't tried full vegan, nor have I tried full carnivore, which makes me want to try both and you should to have the experience and see what that is. Um, I just like eating salads and avocados and stuff like that so it's like it's like a, it'll be a challenging thing for me to take away um that's okay i can get past that um but the one thing that uh, i do agree with off the bat is that it is interesting how we have um 
pushed aside eating organ meats and then put the you know the the muscle bellies as being like that's the primary source whereas throughout history as far as my understanding and 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 present depending upon where you're at um and naturally with animals in the wild the, the the organs and the fats and all that stuff is what's is what's actually valued um so that's something that's interesting to me we talk about that a little bit yeah um looking at indigenous cultures and even looking at the way other animals eat each other, um, generally they go for the fat and the organs first. And if we look at the nutritional content of muscles and organs, they're unique. And this is what's so interesting to me. And one of the more clarifying realizations that I came to when thinking about a carnivore diet, that as I suggested earlier, we as humans can get all of the vitamins and minerals that we need to thrive by eating animals nose to tail, not just the muscles. Muscles are great sources of niacin, pyridoxine, B12, not such a good source of folate, riboflavin, many other things, copper, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, but when we look at the entirety of the animal, which is the way that our ancestors would have eaten animals, the way that indigenous people eat animals, and the way that other animals eat each other, right? we see this large collection of nutrients that is vast, that is um, comprehensive, and that really leaves nothing out. And we can talk about specifics if you want to get into the vitamin C rabbit hole, et cetera. But um, that to me is so interesting. And the way of eating a carnivore diet that I would recommend to people is nose to tail. It's consideration of these special micronutrients that are really only found in liver kidney and some of the other parts of the animal. And so starting to try to mimic the way our ancestors would have eaten those animals uh, leads us to a much more robust and comprehensive collection of nutrients in the foods that we're collecting, the foods that we're eating uh, from an animal basis. And so whether or not we choose to eat a fully carnivorous diet or a carnivore-ish diet, which is something I talk about in the book, and it sounds like you may be, I don't know how you eat now, but you know, eating meat with some avocado and salads is essentially what I would consider to be carnivore-ish. If you're emphasizing animal foods and emphasizing the nutrients that you can derive from animal foods while thinking about a spectrum of plant toxicity, I would consider many things in salads and, um, and avocados to be some of the less toxic things from plants. That could even be considered carnivore-ish. But regardless, when we are eating that way or however, getting nutrients from organ meats is going to help anyone in terms of nutritional adequacy and overall nutritional um, uh, repletion in their body. There's just incredible sources of, of all kinds of things for humans. Have you eaten much liver? Yeah, yeah. So I, that's like the primary thing that I will ingest from animals. So I'm a big fan of like little tiny fish uh, for like, you know, mineral or, or uh, heavy metal reasons. So like sardines and anchovies and you know, things like that. Um, and I do organs. I prefer organs over the, the actual muscle bellies. Um, so whenever possible, uh, but I'm more like, I don't know what, if there was an ish, I'd be more vegetarian ish. I'm like, I try to eat as, as many variety of plants and vegetables and all that. Um, and then also I enjoy butter and eggs and organs and all, all those things. So let me, um, kind of reflected back to you then. Yeah. Well, why why do you make that choice with regard to your nutrition? Why do you choose to focus on more of the plant foods? I think one thing is just joy. You know, like I enjoy the the, the all of the different colors and styles of cooking and uh, flavors and that. Like I, I would find personally just consuming organs and, um, you know, muscle bellies and all that stuff doable you know if i was hanging out with like some inuits or something or i was in some hunter gatherer tribe and that's what we were doing i would like i i would quite enjoy it i'm sure actually um because like if like when in rome i'm like I'm, I'm i'm excited to get involved um but the big thing is like the joy in food you know and so walking into a room and having all the different bright colors and all that stuff and to me that's a huge part of, of eating and that's kind of like the emotional component as well is like that that joy of coming together and having all the different colors in the table and such um and flavors and this and that um to me that's something I, I i get a lot of value out of yeah so it's more of an enjoyment or entertainment perspective rather than a nutritional perspective i just don't feel like i think nutrition is such a slippery subject because there's so much bio individuality and um 
you know, even like the epidemiological studies and such, there's so many different variables within that that could be, you know, affecting the, the, uh, the results of the research. There's so many variables happening. You know, so the reason that I tend to veer more towards like the conversation of, of movement and self care and things of that nature is it's really hard to dispute the uh, efficacy of like a, a deadlift, you know, like the way that you pick something off off the ground, it's like there's pretty much, okay, well, let's see it. Let's watch and we'll see it in real time, you know, and okay, did you blow your back? And then even within that, there is some gray areas as well. But uh, with nutrition, it's like it goes into your face and then life happens and then we have these results. And so I just kind of stay out and just claim lay person the whole time, you know. Yeah, it is. It is quite interesting. <laughs> it's quite interesting. I would be very curious for you to do a carnivore experiment to see I'm, if you I'm would open to, it for sure. to see if you would feel differently because I, I mentioned this in the book. I think that uh, a lot of people really enjoy eating animal foods. I relish them. I find steak and animal foods to be much more enjoyable than plant foods, but not everybody feels that way. And animal foods are not as colorful visually as plant foods. And so the discussion has to be, how are we using food in our life? Are we using food as entertainment? Are we using food um, in another way, or are we using food as nutrition? And I think that when we look at using food as nutrition, I, I think that when we do that, it's pretty cut and dry that, like I said, animal foods are quite nutritious and much more so than plants. And we should not rely on epidemiology for that because that's where things get confused. And that's where people can make arguments that look appealing and ignore other epidemiology studies that are uh, contradictory. That's why, there is so much of an emphasis or there needs to be so much of an emphasis. In my book, I continually emphasize and offer as many interventional studies as I can find. And the interventional studies tell a very different story than the epidemiology. I really think that in terms of epidemiology, we should only be using that to generate hypotheses and then test the hypotheses with interventional, actual, real studies. And so just so people understand what we're talking about here, epidemiology is survey-based research that does no experiment but looks to correlate what people are remembering they've eaten and health outcomes but it has this intrinsic ability or this intrinsic nature that it can be so deeply confounded by many other things people may be doing or eating and not recalling or eating foods together and it doesn't really give us much of an ability to make statements about which foods are better or worse or create um, health or disease so it's so misleading um, to rely on that but I freely admit that that life is about enjoyment and joy, and I would never ask anyone to take foods away from themselves uh, that they were enjoying. I merely seek to offer these uh, these interventional or these methods for people who are suffering, right, yeah. and who are not finding answers with the things that they're doing now. Because I think a lot of people end up in realms where they're sick and they go to see a functional medicine doctor and they tell them to eat a plant-based diet and they get worse and they don't understand what's going on. And I think in those cases, we know exactly what's going on. Yeah. Um, and I think for so many people who are trying that and not having resolution of their disease or inflammation or autoimmunity, that's really, I think, the majority of people that I would offer this to. I do think it can be great for everyone and it can help optimize. And like I said, I'll be super curious to see how much more of a titan you turn into when you eat more meat and more organs and less plants. But um, I do want people to know that I'm, I'm not dogmatic about this. I'm not trying to remove joy from people's lives. I'm just trying to offer something that people can use to put joy back into their life when they're suffering and not finding a way out yeah. with the current dietary strategies that are out there. And I don't think anyone is really calling attention to the fact that plants can be very toxic in many people. I'll just add one more thought there. Um, the bioindividuality piece, I think, gets thrown around a lot. And I, I don't really buy it. Um, and I talk about this in the book as well. I don't think humans are as different as we believe we are. Um, certainly, physically, we are different shapes and sizes, and there are genetic variances in the way that we may immunologically respond to certain foods. But I believe that at a fundamental level, 
we all have essentially the same biochemistry. We all use the same receptors. We all use the same mechanisms in the gut to absorb nutrients. And I really don't believe that there are some people for whom plant foods are going to be the best and others for whom animal foods are going to be the most nutritious. I think that animal foods are universally going to create, going to allow a human being, a homo sapiens organism to absorb and have access to more nutrients and less toxins. Having said that, I do do think that there is some variability in terms of how people react to plants and some people may tolerate more plants than others but looking at human biochemistry and the as, as I said the mechanisms of the absorption of minerals and vitamins in the gut and the way that we use those vitamins and minerals in human physiology I think we are all pretty much the same and that animal foods are what we've been programmed to be eating for millions of years and that when we give ourselves that we really upgrade the programming and, and can allow ourselves to to become optimal so but the I, I just, I mentioned that because I think that the bio-individuality arguments can be a little bit, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Uh, we got to wrap up. We got to jump over to the other side. Um, but I would, the one thing that kind of comes to mind is I don't necessarily believe that there needs to be or always is a separation between joy and nutrition. And I think that there is something to intuitively eating what feels good and feels joyful. You know, so I don't think that there is like, okay, joy switch turned on. Okay, nutrition switch turned on. Joy, bad, nutrition, good. I think that naturally humans, I don't think we know what the hell is going on for the most part. And if we get out of the way of ourselves enough and the books that we read and the ideas that we have, I think that our internal intelligence is smarter than, you know, what we probably give it credit for. And I think that there is some degree of feeling like, okay, this this feels good when I reach out for this lamb meat, organ, eyeball, avocado, whatever the hell, egg, whatever the thing is reaching out for that feels good. Um, it seems like you disagree that our, that our intuition is able to kind of feel into what, what feels appropriate for our body. I think that so much of what we're eating now is so highly processed that the intuition is, is invalid. You know, if we're looking at highly processed plant-based foods, that's... If new. intuition is invalid, so what do we base our lives off of? Just purely off of other people's opinions and ideas no. that are written books? No, I think that it, you. I think we could use intuition, but that means you have to eat plants raw and cooked or raw or simply cooked with no other spices, right? Like, there's, there's just, there's too much that we've done to food to change the way that we're experiencing it, okay? Intuition only works with food if we are number one not metabolically deranged not metabolically damaged right if we have insulin resistance if we are addicted to carbohydrates like we are going to intuitively crave bread and pasta and sugary foods this does not mean that these are good for our biology what about people in france that are eating baguettes and all that stuff and there's like the what is it the french what is it called? The French not paradox. French, not paradox. Yeah. Th yeah. Of that nature. So you're, you're, we're, we're reverting back to epidemiology here. We need to look at individuals and well, just looking at, pe looking at people, you know, looking at like, just look, I, I, the, for me, I feel like the thing that I trust the most, like my, my textbook is when I see a person that seems like they're killing it and I get near them, I say, what's going on in there? Right. You know, and if, if a person's not killing it, I don't ask them questions. Exactly. So let's go to France and see how many people eating a lot of baguettes are killing it. What you were suggesting there is kind of a broad statement regarding epidemiology with France rather than an individual that's killing it, right? There's not an individual you're thinking of that eats a tons of baguettes that you're seeing is killing it. No, I know them. Yeah. Well, I went out there for a rock climbing trip. Not to say that baguettes are like the best thing. I mean, I'm, right. I don't I mean, eat a lot of bread personally, but I mean, I've seen it. I've seen like world... I don't know a world-class athlete, to be honest, that is a carnivore. And I know lots of world-class athletes that aren't. So, and right. the people that I'm like, they're radiant, shining beings. It's like, oh, like, wow, like what's going on in there? So age can be a factor, right? I think that we know that there are people in the NFL that are in their early 20s that eat McDonald's every day. And I don't think anybody's arguing that McDonald's is good, nor that we should be eating McDonald's intuitively. So there's a little bit of a nuance here that we have to be very careful of as we use Well, then, this. then it begs the question that perhaps... Nutrition is not the longest lever. Nutrition I'm not is, saying that absolutely it is absolutely the longest lever. I don't know, man. It's I don't clearly know. Clearly, the longest lever. <laughs> so, how does that def how does that explain the McDonald's eating superstar? How much better would they be if they even improved beyond when they're that, the right? absolute best in the world? I mean, maybe they'd be better, but they're the fucking best in the world <laughs> for for for, <laughs> so, I mean, for a short amount of time until they get injured, and then what's their you know you need to have a case study, you need to have one individual. We're talking in sort of broad platitudes, but 
I think that what we see in humans is that before, uh, probably for the first 25 years of our life, we have a, a fair resilience in terms of uh, what we do as humans and what we eat. We seem to have an ability to eat almost anything and not get sick. But many people listening to this podcast are beyond that stage. And it's when we get to that stage where we seem to experience chronic disease that the shit hits the fan, man. Yep. And look at these look at these football players later in their life. They're obese. They have arthritis. They're very poorly um, mobile. They're not healthy later in their life. I mean, look at look at look at these ex athletes, man. Most of them are fat, obese, heart attacks, hypertension. You can't tell me that this is the right thing long term. That I'm, gets more into more epidemiology, where it's you're, there's so many other factors with that, and they're probably you know been exercising exactly. an immense amount, and then they have that same lifestyle, and then you know there's so many different facts. It's almost like a non conversation. Exactly, which is what I'm saying that we need to have one case study and look at how that person could be improved. Yeah. Right. And then you think athletes in the NFL, they're eating McDonald's and they're just supplementing tons of stuff or who knows what else they're taking. Right. There's they're in a way they're they're not normal individuals. How much supplementation is going on there with quotations and things yeah. like this. So it's a very slippery slope. It's a very you squishy zero supplements then? conversation. I don't take any supplements. Hmm. I mean, it depends what you define as a supplement. Do you think of animal fat as a supplement? I don't. It's not processed. Right. Yeah. No, no. Of course not. No. Uh, at times, I've done collagen powder, but I don't even do that anymore because I'll just eat real tendons. Yeah. So, yeah, no supplements. Water, I mean, salt. Is salt a supplement? Uh, some people might say it is. I don't think it is. Yeah. Um, it's a rock. Yeah, but I don't do any pills or anything like that, no. Yeah. So, my, I wonder uh, if there's like the, and we really got to wrap up, but like the, what do they call it? Like the equator rule or something? That we, uh, whatever. A closer person is to the equator, the more fruits they will potentially be able to um handle in a good way compared to someone that's like in alaska or up north where it's like okay well you probably don't have a lot of banana trees growing you know and avocados like probably just doesn't exist so people from that place would naturally do better with eating more whale blubber and you know lamb lamb brains yeah i think that there's some genetic variation in terms of tolerance to carbohydrates based on exposure um, some have used the equatorial argument to suggest that because people near the equator eat more plants, we should be eating more plants or that there's some variation there. But I think that basically um, I would love to see the experiment where people near the equator are just given more animal foods. And what we can only extrapolate that based upon is currently living or recent historical accounts of people in those places. And many of those indigenous peoples who are living they have had their hunting grounds changed and they don't have access to things they might have hunted in the past. But yeah, in places in the world where there's access to more tropical fruit, perhaps people more, perhaps people have developed genetics that give them more ability to tolerate that. But I don't think that means that that's ideal for them hmm. or that they provide any specific nutrients because then we're talking about macronutrients versus micronutrients, right? If we're talking about carbohydrate versus protein versus fat ratio, sure, there might be some variability based on where you are in the equator. But I don't think that there is really any good evidence that there are unique things in fruit that are highly beneficial for humans. Cool. I'm not smart enough. You're skeptical. Oh, I'm totally skeptical. Well, that's okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure I'll remain skeptical, but uh, I just love sharing various different opinions, you know, and, and people listen to this now, they'll probably be able to tune in to some vegan argument last week or the week after this and i enjoy getting to gather because i think from the nutritional lens at least um it becomes very dogmatic and it becomes very like religious almost uh and so i personally enjoy getting to go into the various different churches and talk to the priests gather the information then come back and follow my intuition <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not to say that my intuition is right. I, I'm suspicious of myself. I think for the most part, I'm probably um, incorrect on many things. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and just going back to the intuition thing quickly as we wrap up here. Um, I don't know if our GoPro just no, turned fine. off. It's fine. Um, the, uh, I, I think that the combining of flavors is confusing, right? If you combine a sweet flavor, like, look, kale doesn't taste good on its own, man. Have you had, like, raw kale plain? It tastes bitter. It's horrible. But you can... But nor does does the ass of a of a of a deer taste very good i mean but i i think that i mean that's like a that's not a non-argument too like to who how how good does a liver taste 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, I never developed a taste for raw kale. And well, let's compare an apple or a strawberry to a liver. I mean, it's not a good argument if that's your argument. Well, that's not necessarily what I'm saying. Okay, <laughs> those are fruits which are part of what plants are trying to get other animals Avocado. to consume. Right? Avocado is Avocado's pretty. Avocado is fruit too. Actually. Avocado is pretty yeah. bland, but in whatever. my opinion. I'd rather eat. I would They're rather delicious. eat meat than avocado. It's like butter. It's like green butter. Uh, <laughs> But listen, like avocado is a fruit too, but like kale, <laughs> it is a fruit, super know. bitter, man, <laughs> super bitter. Yeah. But you're, but if you cook it in a pan with olive oil and salt, Hell you can yeah. say, you can say, well, but then you, but then well, olive oil is an olive. It's but then, still what, not a then what you're liking is <laughs> oil and salt. You're eat, you're eating fat and salt with the kale. It's not the kale. So that's where the intuition goes wrong. You but say I'm like, pro olive oil, and so I think people should eat more olive oil and more salt. Right, but <laughs> do you see what I'm saying here in terms of the way it, it confuses? I don't think you can use intuition. Uh, to say that that kale is 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 something your body wants when you're eating kale with olive oil and but salt then, or something else. But then that's you look at like, flavors. like ayahuasca. You, you know, for ayahuasca to function, you need to pair other plants with it for it to become psychoactive in your system. So it's like, well, the ayahuasca vine by itself, it's like a non-thing. It's like, well, when no, ayahuasca is just a piece. Perhaps the deliciousness of avocado and salt and pepper and olive oil and all that stuff and some kale. Maybe it's like there's it's like some shamanic ayahuasca. Correlates. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta wrap this thing up. <laughs> um, thanks for uh, digging so deeply in all this stuff, man. I really yeah, brother, for you. sure. Yeah, it's really fun. I really love. It. And thanks for shooting the bow with me. Yeah, man. Thanks for sitting out in the grass, getting some sun. Sort These of are sun. the things that we will absolutely uh, perennially agree on. Is all of those other yeah. factors? Yeah. The only place I just need to I, I my opinion is meaningless until I do the things. I think my opinion is without value. So do the things. I gotta do the things. Yeah. Anyways, uh, where should people go? They, you got a book coming out. When's when's the book coming? Book comes out in February. Cool. Website is carnivoremd.com. Great. You can find everything there. All the sites, socials, or carnivoremd. Awesome. Well, right, man. Thank you for uh, accepting me into. The church of carnivore. <laughs> it's not a church, man. <laughs> this ain't dogma, bro. A tribe. Maybe it's a tribe. There's no dogma here. No dogma. All right. Uh, and I would debate a vegan any day. Thank you, thank you, bro. All right. Over now. Thanks for listening. Wow. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did with Dr. Paul Saladino. If you did enjoy this conversation, I would recommend jumping over and checking out perhaps the Paul Check episode. Uh, you can check out the Mark Sisson episode. Or you could check out the episode that I discuss my own outlook on nutrition, which is always changing. Um, thanks so much for reviews on iTunes. Thanks for sharing this with your friends. If you have any insights that you found particularly interesting, uh, please share those guys on Instagram. It'd be a great place wherever you do your shares and tag Align Podcast. And there's a good chance I will reshare that thing. And finally, thanks for grabbing the Align Method book and the Align Method online program, which is a seven-day free trial. If you've got any aches and pains or stiffness in your body, um, you want to feel more confident, creative in your body throughout the day, uh, staring at a cell phone and sitting on a desk under artificial lights and all that stuff is very challenging for that. And so the Align Method online program teaches y'all how to integrate more effective movement into your daily life, whether it be travel, whether it be spending time in an office, or at home, any of those places, they're all opportunities if we understand the basic fundamental guidelines. And that's what that breaks down. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. I'll see you all on Thursday. Bye.